Hello everyone. How is how is everybody doing? How is everybody doing? Hey guys, can you just type in the chat box? Whoever who all are attending, just say hi. Hey everyone. Hi Chitral. Hi Trisha. Hi Om. Hi Shreyas. Hello Ayushi. Hi Nilakshi. Hello Nimesh. Hello Riddhima. Hello everyone. Hey Shubham, how are you? Hello people attending from YouTube. Hi Aryan. Hi Salman. Hi Dikshit. Hello Deep. So shall we begin or should we wait? Just put a thumbs up sign if you want me to begin or do you, if you don't, just type don't. We need to wait a little more. <laughs> cool. One person says go. Let's go. Okay. So to begin with, I'm going to bore you a little with a little presentation I made. I hope you don't get bored, but disclaimer. So tell me if everybody can see this. Can everyone see that? Yes, OK. So a complete audio production workshop. So let's begin. Uh, all knowledge exists within a person and just has to be drawn out with skillful questioning. I don't know why I put it there, but ju it just seemed profound. So I put it there. Uh, so whatever uh, I am going to cover today, I will be asking you guys a lot of questions. Those who are attending on Teams can just unmute and talk, or and those who are attending from YouTube can just. Uh, type in the chat box or whatever they feel comfortable with. Uh, and as the slide says, your questions have to be answered like you are answering uh, or you're explaining to a nine year old. So it will be easier for everybody to understand and not just engineers. Uh, with that, just tell me how many of you uh, are, you know, engineers and how many of you have are not doing a course in any technical background. Just can you type in the chat box? How many of you all are engineers? Engineering, Sanika is doing engineering, great. Others? Engineering. Hey Vidan, how are you? Hey Kalpesh. Engineering. So a decent number of people are doing engineering here. So I guess we'll be getting a lot of technical answers, but let's see. Uh, Aryan says I'm not doing I'm not an engineer and I'm not doing any course. That's cool. Fine. Just I need to have some a good set of ears and a brain. That's all you need for audio production technically. <laughs> Um, so can anybody tell me what sound is? Imagine I'm a nine year old and tell me what sound is. Anybody can from teams can just unmute and speak or if you're not comfortable speaking, you can just type in the meeting chat.
I'll, I'll, I'll skip through the presentation real quick. So you'll have to answer for effort. Let's go. How many of you can answer what sound is? Okay, Nimesh Saban says, Jo Sunai Deta hai, very good. That explains quite a lot. Anybody else who would like to try? Okay. Now, anybody else wants to try or should I skip to the next question? Okay, chat seems silent. Uh, how does sound propagate? How do you explain this to a nine year old? Can anybody tell me? Just use simple language, nothing else. Nothing has to be fancy and all. Just use simple language. Hindi is also fine. Marathi is also fine. Just tell me whatever you all know. How does sound propagate? Sound Anybody? Let's check the YouTube. Waveform. Okay. Waveform. That's great, but what kind of wave? Okay. So, what sound is? Sound is basically a form of energy. You know, like air vibrates. And that what that's what creates sound. Sine. Um, it is not technically a sine wave, but okay. Uh, so sound is as Sanika rightly suggested. Yeah, Nimesh, correct. Longitudinal waves, correct. So as uh, Sanika said, it is a wave. She was correct. So for sound to propagate, there has to be a medium present. Uh, for the sound to propagate, am I right? So for sound to go from one place to another, there has to be some medium that is present for the vibrations to transfer from one molecule or atom to another. So as the slide suggests, sound has three stages. First is the source, which in this case is my vocal cords, the conduction or the medium, which is the air right now, and the absorption or the destination is this mic. Can you all uh, see my mic in the this thing? Can you see this? Can you all see this? Just type yes. yes. Oh, hey, don't call me sir, yeah. I'm just a bloke. Uh, so we'll just skip yeah. through this fatafat. Sound propagation, it, yeah. Rugved says yes, okay. So it propagates a series of compression and refractions. The speed is 340 meters per second at 20 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, uh, not many people specify the temperature when you are, you know, specifying the speed of sound. So speed of sound actually varies varies with the rise or fall in your temperature. So we'll just skip through this presentation fatafat and get your basics clear. If you have any doubts, just type uh, and uh, we'll try and clear it. So sound theory and its attributes, sound and its attributes, basically. So uh, can anybody tell me what amplitude is? Just go and just try. Don't fear. I'm not a professor or anything like that. Just tell me what amplitude is. Like in the basic sense, what does ampli amplitude contribute towards the characteristics of a sound. Just take a random guess. Wrong answers are welcome. Guys, can anybody tell me what amplitude is? Come on, you all are engineers. You should know. Highest peak of a wave. Okay. Anybody else would like to try? <coughs> so without going all technical, because sound engineering and audio or audio engineering is like you, it's a techno artistic field. You there there is some technical knowledge involved in all this. 
but at the end of the day it is an artistic field when you are producing or when you are recording or when you are mixing or even mastering for that matter it is an artistic field so will not go into a technical uh, definitions and formulas and what not of all this and we'll just you know what like what amplitude basically would mean is it will contribute to the loudness if loudness if the amplitude is more the wave or your sound will be louder correct so amplitude will be the loudness of your uh, sound signal so the greater the amplitude the greater the loudness uh, can somebody tell me what frequency is or what is the synonym of frequency just take a random guess okay so what frequency basically means is occurrence per unit time okay that is one frequency basically contributes to your pitch the higher the frequency the low or uh, the higher the pitch so you might be wondering what pitch is pitch is the basically like how uh like the i am speaking in some register right and now i'm speaking in another register so that contributes to the pitch and if you all are laughing just karkashapana <laughs> is pitch okay that is good so karkashapana is pitch that is a good definition yeah so uh, yeah that is a good definition uh, hiram so the like if you look at a baby crying it cries in a very higher pitch right or if you listen to some flute which is being played at a very high register it is a higher pitch are you all understanding the pitch or should i explain it better just type yes or no whatever because i think i explained it a little weird yeah okay everybody else understood what pitch is so oh, wavelength velocity and phase acha okay so how many of you all know the difference between phase and polarity you all are engineers you must know what is the difference what is the difference between phase and polarity because this these terms are quite often misused in sound the faster you answer the faster this presentation will end and we'll get to the good stuff so just answer quick phase and polarity okay so i guess no don't know about polarity okay so what polarity is is basically in what quadrant your wave is right polarity deals with pressure and phase deals with time okay phase is time okay nimish you're correct like phase is like the orientation of a wave around an axis correct so if this imagine my hand is a wave right and this is my axis so what polarity would mean is the orientation of the wave whether it is this way like if you imagine a sine wave going right can you all see my hand properly this type yes no whatever yes so uh imagine a sine wave right this is a sine wave imagine a sine wave and this a polarity reverse would be this if this is a sine wave polarity reverse would be this the top goes down positives become negative and the negative becomes positive that is polarity and phase is always compared between two signals correct so if these are two signals which are completely in sync with each other this this will cause the phase difference between the signal not the polarity where can i find the previous recorded section uh chitral can you answer him please because i have no idea 
the you uh, you'll find it on the YouTube of our channel, and also you will have a link which we can give you. So you can feel free to check that out on the YouTube channel of CSI. Okay. So, um, where was I? So yeah, this the time difference with, between two waves is called the phase difference, and this the orientation difference basically is called the polarity difference. So that is also one aspect of um, a sound. What is harmonic content? Does anybody have any idea? You all have learned vibrations of a string in your 11th and 12th. You know the nth order harmonics of a wave, right? So can anybody take a random guess? Achha, by the way, if you all have any doubts, just feel free to ask, right? Clear it now because when we'll move on to the breakdown, if your basics are not clear, it'll be difficult to understand. Hey, so just. So, what harmonic content is like the nth order multiples of a frequency, right? So, if my frequency the root frequency of mine is 100 hertz the second harmonic will be 200 hertz right and that is what makes an octave so odd harmonics and even harmonics will not get much into that uh, but yeah, that is the thing and then we'll move to the envelope so envelope is basically the attack, decay, sustain, and release of a signal. So how a such signal behaves in the time domain is what uh, contributes to the envelope of a signal. So if a signal has a fast attack, that means it will reach to its maximum uh, amplitude in a very slow, short amount of time, correct? So it will go from zero to highest in a very short amount of time. Whereas if an attack is slow, it will go in a gradual way. So uh, that is the attack of a signal. So if how many of you all are musicians or play any kind of instrument at all? Ukulele, tabla, guitar, keyboards, drums, whatever. Ukulele, okay. Anybody else? Sujay, overtone, yeah, correct. You can get our chitral, okay. Anybody else who plays an instrument? Acha, so tell me how many of you all have been to all these Ganpati Visarjan ka Mironuks? I guess everyone has seen them, seen them right? Uh, basic guitar, okay. So, if you imagine the sound of a tasha, does everybody know what a tasha is? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sanika, yep. Hiram, yes. So, a tasha is basically what has a very fast attack, correct? It goes from, it's a very loud instrument, right? So, it goes from zero so deafening loudness in very short amount of time. When you hit it, it does not go. It does not. It's a cut, cut, cut. It goes like that, right? Very short and very transient sound it has. So it has a very fast attack. And how many of you all have heard any type of orchestral stuff, like proper symphony orchestral stuff? I guess everybody must have heard it. Everybody must have listened to the score of Sairat, right? Yes. Can I get a yes from everyone? I have. Okay. Everybody has heard the score of Sairat, right? Piano and guitar. Kalpesh, yes. So, when the strings are doing all those very slow swells, the attack is very slow, right? When these strings are blossoming from so the rest of strings up, they get allowed. That is a very slow attack. Now, release would be the time between uh, ADSR, so attack decay, 
dk would be the time that is taken for uh, by a signal to uh, reach from the highest amplitude to its sustaining amplitude so it is not there is not much to explain in here but the sustain will be the uh, what can i say the amount of time the wave holds a particular amplitude is called the sustain correct so again the example of strings is the best because when you are playing all the long parts in a string or an orchestra or a violin the there is the string holds on for a long time right when they are bowing the string very slow it holds on for a long time right so that is a uh, greater sustain or a larger sustain so let's move ahead decibel theory decibel theory is basically uh, a quantitative measure to measure the loudness of a sound so it is a logarithmic value as the ppt suggests and uh, it gives us an idea about the like quantitative idea about the loudness of a sound you must have heard on the 80 decibels and 70 decibels and you cannot go above 100 decibels or 110 decibels so that is basically the decibel calculations dbspl stands for sound pressure level correct so it is basically a, there is a formula involved I, i won't be going into that because we're not interested in that right now so dbspl will be the sound pressure level uh, that a wave generates and there are two common measurement categories there is dba and dbc so dbc is basically used for all your measurement purposes so it is there are the weightages of a scale uh, you all are engineers you all might know what a weightage is so let's go ahead and decibel theory this is just a image i procured from google which tells you how how loud something is acha interesting fact that i just remembered is the like sound waves have such great pressure that uh, everybody seen a rocket launch like P we just launched a pslv like recently right for brazil we launched a pslv so have you all seen a uh, a rocket being launched a space rocket being launched it yes yes great yes yes sure be so the amount of sound that is generated or the of the sound pressure level that is generated by a rocket is such high that the waves that the reflections that rebound from the ground or the launch pad are it that they disturb the orientation of the uh, rocket itself they are that high uh, they are that high in <clears throat> energy so interestingly what they do is they pump large amounts of water in it's like they just have a big tub like thing and there are large amount of water that is spilled this tank to the rocket launch so that is the amount of interesting uh, how many of you have an idea of fletcher once in curves just say yes if you know the say no if you don't does anyone have an idea about fletcher once in curves no would it no okay so fletcher munson curves basically describe how our uh human ears respond to particular frequencies and how loud these frequencies need to be uh if for us to hear them clearly so are you all seeing this curve are you all seeing all this diagram properly Mm, yes so if as you can see the y axis is the intensity so that is the decibel level of the sound and on the right, uh, x axis this is the frequency and from this graph can anybody tell me what this graph signifies like what this graph tells us 
which is very apparent in this region. Can anybody tell me that? Okay, so what this graph basically denotes is like our human ears are basically more sensitive towards the mid frequencies. Like if you see from 400 or 500 hertz from here till uh, like 3000 3, hertz or 4000 hertz. So if you can see this line is pretty flat everywhere, right? So you uh, yeah, human ears are pretty sensitive towards the mid range of frequency. Does anybody have an idea why human ears are more mid range centric? Like why don't we hear bass as clearly or the as we hear the mid frequencies? Just take a random guess. It's very local. Okay, no response. So what, how we have evolved this, our surroundings, because we can only hear sounds from 20 to 20,000. Uh, Rohan, so mid range is from, from like mid range, there is a, from 500 Hertz, let's say, to three or 4,000 Hertz. So that is between our audible range. So Rohan, can you elaborate on your answer a little more? Because those mid frequencies are within our spectrum of hearing or your audible frequency range. So what it basically tells us is our human ears are basically more um, sensitive toward mid range because all our speech is in mid range. When you talk, you don't talk in bass frequency or just the high frequencies, correct? You have a very mid-range centric voice. Everyone has a mid-range centric voice, right? So that is why human ears have evolved to be more specific towards the or sensitive towards the mid-range. Also, what this curve denotes is that if you see at this, uh, can you all see the pointer? Can you all see my mic mouse pointer? Yeah. So. At, if you can see at 80 decibels, the red line is very close to being flat, right? So what from 80 to let's say 85 decibels, the, this, this curve is the flattest. So that denotes that our human hearing, hearing is the best when we are at a loudness or when we are hearing at a loudness of 80 to 85 decibels. So, and threshold of audibility and the threshold of pain is very self-explanatory. Even like if you go beyond that, your ears will start hearing or uh, hurting. And if you go below this, you won't hear anything. So let's move ahead. A uh, little boring part once more. So history of sound reproduction. So what are basically uh, our, all our Spotify and Apple Music and Deezer or YouTube Music, which nobody uses apparently, are driving on is the sound reproduction because whatever is recorded, the purpose of recording a sound is its reproduction, correct? So if phone, auto, phone autograph was not invented, all your Spotify, Apple Music, nothing would have existed. So it started with the phone autograph, then it moved to phonograph then everybody must have seen a gramophone, right? In all those vintage movies, everybody has seen those gramophones. Then came the LP records. Then they, we moved to magnetic tape. Uh, I'll just skip through it very quickly because this is not as relevant for this uh, LP records. Then there was magnetic tape. And then we went on to the digital era with the ADADs and your CDs. And the, and the DAWs, which you are using right now. So one thing that has happened is uh, when rec these recording devices were created, like 
the LP records or the early gramophones, they were very noisy, correct? And like people were striving towards cleaner and cleaner recording or reproduction styles. Like they wanted no noise, no buzzes, no noise created because of friction of the tape moving or the LP vinyl moving. So what happened with advent of technology is the medium became cleaner and cleaner. So as we went on to CDs, the or DAWs or your streaming services, the medium became cleaner and cleaner. There is no tape noise. There is nothing of noise as such. But what uh, us engineers or product producers or even the <clears throat> audiophiles realized is that that uh, noise or that saturation that analog systems provide was missing from the new cleaner recordings. So to get a good sound, uh, we have resorted to adding noises created by this these all uh, vintage gears nowadays. So we use saturation, with, we, we use digital media, digital softwares to add this. What has happened is uh, we have resorted to adding uh, noise created or the saturation created or the compression that is created by these uh, records or the tape mediums that were used before. So an interesting analogy that was taught to me was if you imagine a person who eats a pani puri, uh, this, this is not my analogy by the way, I don't take credit for it. So if you imagine a person having a pani puri in a five-star restaurant, let's suppose, right? Or even you having any one of you go to a restaurant and order a pani puri. Do you think you all like it? I guess not because everything is clean there. Because what, like, you won't have the taste that a thera wala pani puri would have because there is not uh, the dirt or the sweat or his what wherever is has been that that all are contributing towards the taste of the pani puri right that won't be there in a five star restaurant so that is what is happening with audio also so like we are adamant on adding saturation and noise created by these uh mediums so this is what an lp record looks like uh, by the way, if you all are new to progressive rock, alternate rock, alternative rock, go and listen to this album. You'll have like this is the greatest album, greatest sounding album ever produced. So let's get to the fun stuff now. So you might be wondering, how can I produce a good song? So in a book called Modern Recording Techniques, there is a good rule that is written. And the good rule is good musician. Everything you do or record or produce will start with a good musician. Because even if you have a musician who has, um, let's say, like a two lakh rupees ka guitar and he doesn't know how to play a guitar, it won't be good at all, right? So what it starts with first is a good musician. Then it comes down to a good instrument. Then how he performs or gives his take a good performance. Then good acoustics of the room. So room acoustics are like very, I would say, being ignored by many of our home studio producers because not many of us are aware what good acoustics are. They will just put all those egg carton wala sound, glorified sound foams and we'll think that oh our room is treated but there is a very deep science that is involved and if you all want to pursue a master's in that there is a very good there are very good opportunities present then uh, good acoustics then it boils down to a good mic so a good mic or your mic choice will contribute to a good sound too like 
if you have an expensive Neumann mic or an expensive AKG mic versus if you have a cheap Samson mic, your <clears throat> quality of recording would differ like crazy, right? You know what I mean? So when after choosing a good mic, you need a good mic placement. Now this is a, this is where the art in recording comes. Like people like Al Schmidt or uh, uh, Bruce Widdin or all these great recording guys and even uh, Shantanu Hudlikar, which is who is like the greatest uh, audio engineer India has ever produced. He, he was working at YRF. So he has recorded like many of our Bollywood films and is a master of recording arts. So record recording arts, right? So good mic placement. This is a very important um, like rule or technique or art that needs to be learned. And all this contributes to a good sound. So if you want to record uh, your signal, right? If you want to record like yourself, you want to record yourself singing, what is the basic signal chain that you need? Acha, do you, does anybody have a doubt what a signal chain is? So if anybody is wondering, signal chain is the path that a signal takes. The signal flow is what comes after what. So that is called a signal chain. So first uh, will be my source, which if you want a live demo is my throat or my voice. So first will be the source. Then will come the mic, which is the transducer. So everybody is an engineer here. So everybody might be knowing what a transducer is. So after transducer will come yeah, your audio, audio, audio interface. Oh. Uh, okay. So Sorry, after yeah, or your audio interface. Uh, after your audio interface will come your uh, DAW. So what an audio interface basically is, is it converts your um, analog signal into a digital signal or your digital signal into an analog signal. So when you are recording, like say this mic I'm using to record, which is a transducer, and this mic is sending out electrical signals, correct? So for your PC to recognize or record these signals, it has to be in a digital format because PC won't record anything analog, correct? So you need a analog to digital converter for your uh, sounds to be recorded. So that is what your interface will be. Uh, how many of you all have seen what an interface looks like or have any idea what an interface is? Has everyone seen an interface, audio interface or sound card? We saw it yesterday. Okay. Yes, Surve. No. Sanir Katsavan, yes. So, and yes, I've seen it earlier on too. Okay. Um, yes, Surve, if you can see this, this is what an audio interface looks like. Uh, can you see this? It looks like this. There are all your inputs and your volume controls involved here. So all your cables, all your mics will be connected to here. And it will convert depending on how kind of, what kind of. I don't think you are in a studio. No, I am not in a studio, dude. This is just a background filter. Yeah. I've uh, just put. The video is very glitchy. Okay. Wait. Mm -hmm. Is there a problem with everyone? Like, does every is everyone seeing my video glitchy or? I 
it was kind of masked off now is it better yeah okay so uh, uh, your audio interface ka signal output would go to your digital audio workstation i guess chitra and tanay covered what a digital audio workstation is yesterday so i won't go into that very much and your digital audio workstation would store it in your hard drive or ssd what is whatever you have in your pc or mac so let's get to this very quick get through this very quickly so a signal to noise ratio is like the most important uh term that comes across uh uh that you come across when you are recording something like so a signal to noise ratio is basically your ratio of your desired signal to your noise or unwanted signal right um the higher the ratio the lesser the noise what it is very easy to understand uh like when you are recording yourself right so you have to set your gain accordingly in your interface so what an interface will have is it will have your transducer which is your mic and there will be a pre amplifier which converts your mic level signal to a line level signal so when you are doing that you will need like it is not something which is uh can be done it is not a set and forget kind of thing when you are uh recording different kinds of instruments or what not so you will have to change this gain um whenever you are <clears throat> uh, you know recording something just wait a minute so when setting the gain what you need to know basically is when you are recording you need your signal to be healthy so by healthy i mean it needs to be at a decent level which is audible to your human ears and it will like it like the signal to noise ratio will be better when you have a good or healthy signal so but it is not like you just keep on turning and your signal will get healthier it is not that easy so what you need to know is like uh when you are using too much gain there will be digital clipping so how many electronics engineers here and can anybody tell me what clipping is very briefly in a very layman's language what clipping is so clipping is basically like chopping off of the waveform so if you have a sine wave if you clip it very highly it will become a square wave right can anybody understand this like there is a sine wave and you keep on clicking it it keeps chopping off it keeps getting chopped off the audio volume exceeds a certain value correct so that is what uh, clipping basically is correct so when you are at your threshold like which is like 0 decibels in your door with 0 db mark your signal would start chopping like literal it if it is a curve it will start becoming squarer so that is what uh, clipping is and that will deteriorate your signal like crazy so uh, make sure you are not clipping the signal ie make sure your signal does not cross the 0 db mark on your daw or does not hit the red hitting the red is like your interface will have some sort of visual indication at the hardware level which indicates that um the signal is clipping so if you have a meter or if you have a, like a focus red interface your knob will glow red or your meter will glow red so that so what hitting the red means uh digital clipping is horrible keep a headroom of 10 to 12 decibels to avoid an unexpected clipping so what headroom basically means is keep a like a little bit uh, amount of space for any unexpected noises that are happening or an, like if your singer sings too loud in the middle so keep like preemptively keep some headroom for that so let's move on to the breakdown uh 
Achha, are there any doubts that anyone has before we move to the breakdown from yesterday? Abhi, does anyone have any doubt? You can just unmute or you can chat if you want. Nope. Everyone says no. And everyone else understood everything. You have Sanika, you have a doubt or you understood everything. Understood. OK, great. That means I'm a great teacher. So. Let's move. I'll just stop sharing and stare at a different screen. Just hold on a minute. Yeah. Mm. Can everybody see this? Can everybody see my DAW? Yes. So what we'll do now is so this is a song that the band of floating bottle recorded a little while back and like we released it and we have gotten very good reviews about it. So when I was asked to, you know, conduct a seminar or seminar slash workshop on audio production. I thought it would be best to tell you guys about how some song that I actually created and re released commercially. So you will have a better idea as to what you know to do when you are even if you want to, you know, let's say suppose release your own song or something like that. So. Uh, we, what we'll do now is we'll just play through the whole song and we'll go down breaking each element and you know <clears throat> go on clearing whatever doubts you all have. We'll just go on clearing it. So just tell me if the levels are too loud. Uh, before we start, how many of you are wearing headphones or earphones? I guess you should have some kind of the playback device, right? Don't listen on your phone speakers or your um, uh, desktop speakers or your laptop speakers. Use some kind of headphones. OK, so we'll just go through the song. And if the sound is too loud or the sound is too quiet, just type in the chat box. OK, so let's go. I'll just we'll just play through the whole song and then we'll go on breaking down each element. Sortable. It's not audible. Just a second. I'll... Yeah, now it will be audible. Mm -hmm. Now it is audible. Yeah, cool.
was a song and it's called parinda by the floating bottle that is my band proudly presenting uh, thanks reyes thanks anika thanks rugvet so uh, on the lead vocals we have chinmay ketkar for harmonies there was i and avinash sena who is the second guitarist besides me Uh, in the band on bass there is chaitanya parolekar who is a fantastic pianist as well and he's playing pianos in this song as well for guitars there is me and abhinav sena and for drums it's the computer drums are all programmed in here so no credits for drums so but that being said the drums were programmed by me and i ended up or uh, we decided that i should mix and master this song as an independent release and interesting story about this song is the basic song or the structure the, of this song was created in less than 50 hours like there was a competition that was happening and a band was participating in it and we decided that we'll that the competition was we have to record like compose record and deliver the song everything in 50 hours so we did not win it but it turned out to be a great experience and i'll tell you more stories about this song as we go further so everyone heard the sound correct the do i need to increase or decrease the levels everyone hearing it clearly there there were some pops and clicks in the between uh, excuse me for that my system is cough, coughing a little because there are multiple programs running there and the session is a little heavy so excuse me for that and also uh, the audio stream is in mono so if there are any stereo effects i'm sorry you are not you all might not be able to hear them clearly excuse me for that too so are the levels correct do i need to increase the level of the song or do i need to you know reduce the level of the song just give me a thumbs up if the levels are correct and give me a thumbs down if the levels are too hot and type up if you want me to increase the levels thumbs up okay everybody else Abhishek Gupta, thanks. Okay, so we'll move. We'll start. We'll break it down structure-wise. So when the song first starts, there is this piano part that is playing, which is like the uh, main melody or the chorus melody that is happening. So what we were planning was like. the first line is urta par nda tha aasman mein so we wanted to have this 
nostalgic vibe to the intro so what we ended up doing was um sorry what we ended up doing was we kept this piano as if a uh, children's toy is played like you all have heard those toys right which you have to wind and then they played all the reeds and that thing happens everybody has heard or seen at least seen those right so the main idea about keeping uh, an intro like this was to have that nostalgic feel to it so i'll just solo this so you'll be able to hear it properly just that piano and nothing else so that was the intro and it is it we uh, it is a digital piano but it is played by chaitanya parulekar and it is not programmed let me clear it this is a actual live performance but on a digital piano that is the only thing so uh, brilliantly played by chaitanya parulekar who is the bassist and the keyboardist in our band he handles two tasks apparently so uh, the, that intro was like the nostalgic feel i told you about so that intro starts and it goes on and it is layered with this sound effects ka thing it is it gives a very ambient vibe to the song and it just opens up the section a little so it sounds like that it sounds like this So was that sound effect clear or do I need to increase it a little I if you couldn't hear it just tell me couldn't hear it It was clear can I get a thumbs up clear okay increase okay so Now was it clear? Yes. So that is the whole pre-intro section, as I like to call it, because the actual intro begins this way. what effect was this which effect was this so this was a uh, slate digital ka ana synth there was some patch in it i don't remember i ended up printing like rendering the effect so i don't i don't have the actual effect right now in the plugin here but if you know slate digital and the ana 2 synth ana 2 synth uh, there is some patch named animals or something like that so it is a default patch that is present in the ana synth uh, anyone have any doubts at this moment any doubts anyone on youtube or here what is this graph what graph dude this graph this red line can you just type yes okay so that graph is basically the i am reducing like it is the volume fade that i have put in so that is like when this is not here and it is like this the sound just begins but i wanted it to start very slowly so i put this fade in so as fade suggests it is like it will begin gradually or like i told you in the 
what the initial presentation that I told you, it will have a very slow attack, right? So I'm reducing the attack of the synth a little and then I'm same thing and doing it in reverse. So that is the graph you're talking about. It is it is just an audio fade. So you can do that in every DAW that you can imagine. It is a, one of the most basic features that any DAW can offer. So it, it just increases. So if you can see the graph, uh, I'll get back to that question. Okay, Rohan. If you can see the graph, it is very linear, right? So this signifies that the sound is linearly uh, increasing and then it is decreasing in this fashion. So that is what it signifies. Now, Rohan is asking, is it affecting the right and left channels differently? No, because this uh, file is one stereo file and it is being put on the whole file um, as a whole. It is not affecting the right and left channels separately. So if Rohan, if you can see this, uh, when I'm putting that fade in, you can see there are two signals present here, right? One is the top and one is the bottom. So when I'm putting the fade in, you can see that both of the signals are reducing the same way. You can see that. Can everybody see that? Both the signals are reducing in a similar fashion. So it is not affecting the left and right channels differently. Um, so that and then we begin with the intro. So the intro guitar starts with a lead and there is an intro that is played behind it. So interesting, uh, how many of you know about meters and what tempo and then time signatures? How many of you all know about that? Was it covered yesterday? Do you need me to elaborate on it a little more? Do I need to elaborate a little more? Sanika? Or no, no elaboration needed. Okay. Every anyone else wants me to elaborate on meters because there is some weird elaborate I missed yesterday. Okay. So what basically a time signature is, is like you have a tempo, right? You have some kind of uh, tempo that is going on in a song. So it is like, dun, 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 dun. so this is, this is a tempo of the song, right? So what uh, a four, four or a four by four, or a six by eight, or a seven by eight signifies is like how many divisions are there in that um, rhythm. So a four, four, four tempo, four, four time signature, I'm sorry, will have four divisions in a measure. So like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that is a four, four time. So, and a six, eight, like it repeats after every four cycle, so that it will be a 4-4 four, four rhythm, correct? And a 6-8 rhythm, it will have six beats in one measure. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it will have six beats instead of four. So uh, the spacing between your each beat reduces and changes according to what time signature you are playing it in. Uh, so that is about tempo and like there are odd tempos, even tempos. So, like, um, like a seven would have in the, in the song, right? So instead of six, it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six, and it like that. It will have seven beats in one measure. So that is about the time signature. And then in this, a very interesting thing is happening is that one guitar is something called as a polyrhythm. So polyrhythm basically means is there are two different rhythms that are going on in the intro. So there is one 6-8 rhythm happening and there is one 4-4 rhythm happening in the guitars. So when you listen to it, just the guitars, I'll solo the guitars for you. So when you listen to it, you can count it. I'll, I'll count it with the song. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
What is happening with the guitars? But if if you can see me counting, I was counting it on four. But if you actually listen to the click, the click or the metronome, you can see that the click is actually going in six four. So I'll just play it. I'll play the click with 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 the click. One two three four five six one. So, was my voice audible? Was I counting when my when I was counting? Was it audible? Could you see correctly? Yes. So you all understood what a polyrhythm or what is going on here, like six eight over four four. You under, you all understood that. Just give a thumbs up. Yes, Sainika, thank you. <clears throat> yes, got it. Anybody have any doubts till this point? Doubts? Anybody? Can you explain it again? Uh, Rohan, don't call me sir. I'm not a sir. Rugved, I'll explain it. Okay. So Rugved, uh, do you know any instrument? I'm sorry if you have told earlier. I'm I'm not I'm not, I'm not able to recall it. But do you know any instrument? Do you play tabla or do you have basic sense of knowledge? So knowledge about what beat is. Rugved. No. Okay. So, uh, what it means is like, see, if the click is playing, right? I'll play the click and I'll count it with the click. Okay, so you'll get a better understanding how, how six measures are counted. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that six beats, what I was counting, one, two, three, four, five, six. That is one measure, so that the song or your your song or your structure is repeating after every six beats. So what I was counting one, two, three, four, five, six are called beats. So it is repeating after every six beats, right? So it is called a six eight or a six four rhythm. I'll uh, quad notes and eighth notes. I'll go into that a little later. I guess it is not needed right now because we don't have that much time to go in that deep a theory. But just know that it is repeating after every six six measures, correct? But if you see, it is the click or the metronome. Acha, ta did Chitral explain what a metronome is yesterday, or should I explain that too? Anybody can just give a yes, no, yes, please. Yes, please. Should I explain it then? Okay. So a metronome is basically a timekeeping device. So when you are playing an instrument or you are recording, you need to keep time of what is going on, right? So you need to be in sync with whatever is playing. So a metronome helps us in achieving that. So if you can see when the metronome is playing, every beat is Acha, tell me if you could hear the metronome. Could everybody hear the metronome? Or was it not audible? You could hear it, right? Okay, great. So when it was playing, it was playing six beats, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that way, it is keeping time of every measure that is happening. So tuck, tuck. Whatever that click was happening, it is helping you keep keep a uh, idea of what is going on. Like so, you can you don't play different stuff. 
uh, and not in sync with everybody so you it is basically a time and tempo keeping device so if you see this the metronome is going 1 2 3 4 5 6 but this intro guitar is going 4 it is repeating after every 4 right so i'll just play it again i'll play the metronome first and then it will start with the four wala guitar excuse me for that just a second yeah Everybody hear the glitch or is it just me? You could hear the glitch. Just give a thumbs up. I'll try resolving it just a second. Okay. So Okay, let's do this. Okay. Hmm. Just hold on a second, yeah, guys. I'll go offline for a minute. Sure. I have restarted the session. It will take a little while to load. By that time, anybody have any doubts, they can ask. Go ahead. Just put on your mic, or anybody on YouTube has a doubt, you can just type in the comment section, whatever. Does anybody have any doubts, guys? Just any doubt. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, can you explain the difference between measure and beat? One measure and one beat. Okay, so one beat is like I was giving the. Is my audio also having a little bit of that glitchy thing when I'm speaking right now? Not no, it's clear. quite. Oh, it's cool, right? So, uh, what a beat is like? I was counting like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? so that each one or two or three or whatever i was counting is called a beat and a measure of like a combination of six beats in this instant is called a measure so 
like one, two, three, four, five, six. That is one measure. Got it? Yes. So measure yeah. can be of four beats also and six beats also, or is it? It can it be is of fixed. any imaginable beat you want. Like I mentioned about the song uh, about that album called Carnival by Carnival called Sound Awake, right? It has a measure of twenty-seven, not even four, six or seven like that. There's a song called Goliath. It has a measure of twenty-seven. So yes, yeah. so it can be anything imaginable, anything you want. You just need to know that it is repeating after those many beats. Got it? Yes, yes, got it. Yeah, yeah. So what we will do now is, anybody have any other doubt? Just speak up. Anybody on YouTube have any doubt? No doubts as such. Okay, just let me try. Can you all still hear the glitch? Was it playing or was it not playing? Yes, it was playing. But uh, was the glitch audible to you? Mm -hmm. Like I can hear the instrument. No, no, but like kar 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 that you were hearing it with that no, song no, or no. not? No glitch, right? No. Perfect. Perfect. So, what we'll do now is when. So you all understood what the polyrhythm is and what is going on with the song. So I'll break down each layer of each, each instrument of what is playing what and what not is playing. So when we go to this, so these are just the guitars that are. That is how the song intro goes. Was that audible correctly? Do I need to increase, decrease any levels? <clears throat> Does anybody can give a thumbs up? Correct. So, <coughs> so that happens in intro, and this is this part here is like an ear candy we ended up doing. Just to you know, it is not audible in the final song as much, but it is a little bit. So it will use oh, this section is also playing. So that is like hidden features of the song. So this also plays with. So that that also plays with whatever guitars are playing, and then. We move on to the actual first in first uh, line of the song, the first lyric or the first verse of the song. So that goes off like this. So 
So these are just the solo guitars, rhythm guitars that are playing behind it. So uh, there is still no glitch, right? Because there, it might happen that there is a glitch because there is a power cut here and that led to something undesirable. No glitch. Okay, fine. So with the verse, you can hear that the guitar is starting very scratchy and not perfect. So what we wanted was like it breaks down and what you, what our mentality or what our thinking was like it breaks down and then it starts like with a pick scratch and then it starts off like this so you heard it like, da, 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 da. that was intentionally programmed and it's not noise or intentionally played for that matter there is very little programming involved in the song and we our band as has a philosophy of you know we are favoring the analog ways more than the digital ways so what we ended up doing was we ended up playing everything programming everything ourselves there are no loops involved uh everything you hear is played or sung by us most of the elements there's the orchestra which we couldn't physically play because we don't have 200 hands so we couldn't play possibly play every instrument so there is there is there are orchestral stuffs also happening in the intro, so that orchestra sounds like this. So for the orchestra, there are there is a section of cello, uh, there is second violins, the first violins. So these three are contributing to the intro as well. So I'll play you the orchestral part. So that is, it is not programmed that great, but we just wanted to have some ambient elements in it. So for the intro part, what I ended up doing was keeping using the orchestra as a synth. So it builds up as the intro goes down. So first there's only the cello playing. Then the second violins add up to the same melody. And then the first violins come up in the last part of the intro. So that happens that the intro is covered so orchestral programming is also a very deep knowledge based field that many of our indian producers specialize in there are many great producers like tanuj tiku who have great youtube channel tutorials and also if you are interested in, at all in orchestral programming you should go check the channels out they're fantastic orchestral programmers and they know the theory quite well and you know, there every one good thing about our industry is everybody is very accommodating and does not have like everybody likes to share whatever they know. So you can just whatever doubts you have, you can just hit them up and they'll just be free with everything and tell you every bit of knowledge they have. So that happens with the verse, though. There is no orchestral stuff in the verse that is happening, just these guitars. And there is a layer of guitar, which is labeled here guitar four, which is happening with the verse. So it goes like this.
this is happening and the worse anybody have any doubts at this moment anybody wants to know why we are doing what we did anybody have any specific doubts if yes just hit or type or just unmute and speak no doubts okay we'll go ahead with the so for the chorus for the main line ta ri ra ri ra ri ra ra ri ra that main line these all elements are playing there is there is orchestra there are there is the main lead vocals there are the harmonies happening in the second part also there is this post rocky guitar lead that is happening in the uh chorus of the song so it goes like this so with everything else it sounds like with every guitars and bass without the vocals it sounds like this so the chorus without the vocals so that happens and in the chorus also we ended up programming a little bit of orchestra so the same celli second violins first violins plays and it play it doubles up basically on this post rock lead i just played for you so it goes like this so it is basically playing what whatever the post rock thing was playing but in just a different texture to induce like stereo width and everything in the song so uh then the chorus hits into a guitar solo so when that happens there's a guitar solo that is being played after the chorus so was that solo audible correctly yes just give me a thumbs up anyone anybody have any doubts at this moment yes it was audible correctly anybody any doubts youtube teams anyone okay so we will go on ahead so how do you recognize the tempo of an instrument so tempo is basically like there will be some beat present to it right when uh uh if you look at this guitar for instance there is no metronome playing behind it so <clears throat> i'll i'll play that so so if you could hear there are like the guitars when they're playing the da 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 you could hear that thang, that pulse happening that boom 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 you could ha- hear it happening right darshan you could hear it happening give me a thumbs up yes so that that there there will be some kind of pulse that that will be happening everywhere you know like even when your heart's beating there is some kind of pulse that is present to it so that that is how you recognize a tempo so like if you could hear the guitar the ra 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 so that is tak 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 
that is the tempo of the song so if you have a metronome on your phone let's say there are many great metronome applications on your phone you could just tap to that there is a in almost every metronome app that is existing on your phone has a tap tempo feature where you if you can hear the pulse and you tap on your phone on that button to that pulse you can calculate the tempo without worrying about anything so that ta ra ra ta ra 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 you can just tap on your phone to that and it will give you the tempo scot free so that is uh where you recognize a tempo of a song you like you cannot humanly like place a number on it like oh if i am here ta ra ra it is 120 or 170 it is not humanly possible to do that but you can use technology to help you that way so am i clear was everything clear darshan yeah okay got it so then the chorus happens again the same chorus repeats uh sorry the verse happens again so in the verse actually there is this thing so when this thing happened like we wanted it to like, when you want a section to explode yeah so what you do is you basically suck out the energy from the previous section right so if there is like a vacuum the thing that is following that and has a great amount of energy in it will just blossom like crazy in everywhere right so we were using that so for kill kar re for that we wanted the section to explode so what do we ended up doing is we ended up like giving the tan tan so like it sucked out the energy just for a moment you hear those beats happening ta dun dun so after that second ta dun dun after the second the energy is dies down right for a milli for a few milliseconds so if the song is here and it goes to zero and just kicks in again the impact that you feel while producing just increases like crazy right so for that reason we ended up doing this break right the energy just goes down and then comes up again so for that reason we did that and then the verse is similar to the first verse that we were that we saw then a chorus happens with again the sim- similar layers same strings same guitars same drums so i won't go into explaining that as much so then all the fun stuff begins in the song so when the this chorus ends and in, so i'll just play you the whole section that is called the bridge of the song so if you can if you listen clearly you will be able to tell that there is something different about this section so i want you all to listen it listen to it clearly and tell me what all is different in this section okay so everybody on youtube also and teams also can listen to it carefully and tell me what's different with this section this section audible properly was there any glitch if there was a glitch type yes there was if there wasn't then type no there wasn't clear 
So, okay. So, can anybody tell me what is different about this section? Just tell me whatever you feel. You can unmute yourself or you can type if you don't want to talk. Can you tell me what you felt was different about this section? Beats. Okay. Great answer. Anybody else? Anybody else would like to try? Great guess, Anika. Okay. Great guess. Beats low. What do you, okay, beats. You do you mean like beats slow down in that sense? Beats low? Uh, like that music was not that intense and fast. Like kind of great observation again. Great, great, great thing. So uh anybody else would like to try? Okay, so what is different about this section is uh when this section happens, it actually goes from six measures to seven measures, and the energy is dialed down for a bit. Yeah, so when this section happens, all the guitars stop, all the drums get a little quieter, and you know, uh, everything just gets a little more ambient and a little mellow. So when you listen to, I'll play it with the metronome. If you listen to it, you can count seven beats happening here, okay? Could you count seven or could you hear me counting seven, everyone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that is what this we ended up doing. That's an interesting story about this. Okay. So when we were actually in the competition, yeah. So it was a like online competition. We had to every the whole of my band was at my house and they came at like morning 10 o'clock and we started composing, we started producing and you know started recording the song as it goes so this section we were wondering like we knew that we had to do something different about this section so when it happened uh we knew that we read it, the basic structure of the song but when we actually rec ended up recording everything that is present before this section it was like uh, like we started at, in the morning in, at 10 o'clock, right? So before everything, before all, the, everything was recorded before this section, it was, and like, it was like 4.30 or 5 in the morning of the next day, right? So we were all very tired and very sleep deprived. So what actually happened was uh, when this section happened, most of the band was sleeping and the second guitarist or the guitarist other than me, Abhinav Sinha was, he was also in a similar state. But when like you are sleep deprived, you tend to go in a trance, right? So what ended up happening is he ended up like creating this very moody uh, riff for this part. Okay, so this, when the seventh thing happens, he ended up creating this... Uh, for the song so it goes like this Wait.
this was originally supposed to be a guitar riff but at the time when i sat down and you know producing and thinking about what goes on where and what is happening i ended up my uh, keyboardist in a band to play this riff on a piano instead so it transformed into a piano riff and that starts all the bridge section of the song so it boils down to a very mellow so same theory again right we want the third chorus to hit more so we are mellowing down the energy of the section before it so if you all are performing and you need some section to explore or you are producing like performing live or you are you, you are a producer yourself and need some section to explore more just dial down the energy of the section before it and the section after it will have much more impact uh, than expected like the threshold like from jump from 0 to whatever your highest punch is it will be greater right difference will be greater so for this section what happened is uh this happens and there are there's some beautiful orchestra like i think it sounds beautiful but i programmed it in a very like layman way like i just ended up doing what felt correct so there is this orchestra that is playing behind this piano okay so i'll play you both if you have any doubts just ask me I'll just play the orchestra and solo once more. clearly everyone just give me a thumbs up whatever yeah so sounds beautiful right like hans zimmer vibe correct so we wanted like a very uh, if you if you if i play the lyric for you you could hear it like there is a very uh, uplifting vibe to the whole lyric i'll just play you the lyrics in solo the vocals in solo से भिड़ जा तूफानो से लड़ मंज के राहों पे चल जख्मों से क्यों डर ना कर ना फिकर खोल दे पंख आगे निकल उड़ जा रे से भिड़ जा तूफानों से लड़ मंजिल की राहों पे चल सो इट इज इट इज बेसिकली इज अ वेरी अपलिफ्टिंग एंड मोटिवेटिंग वाइब ना सो वी हैड दैट इट हैज द ऑर्केस्ट्रा हैज दिस एवरीबॉडी मस्ट हैव हर्ड दोस पायरेट्स ऑफ द कैरेबियन ही इज अ पायरेट एंड ऑल दोस थीम सॉन्ग्स राइट तरा ता 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 इट हैज द सिमिलर वाइब्स विद ऑल दिस हॉर्न्स एंड आल्सो there are this horns that play a counter melody which sounds beautiful again so it is just a small section but it adds up so much to the um you know the whole picture yes yeah? so i'll i'll play this section again with the orchestra on the se bhed ja tu paano se lad चल 
that is one small section but added, it adds so much um you know depth to the whole part so what happens after is like okay anybody speaking okay so it adds anybody has any doubts at this moment anybody wondering what is going on just ask because we have an entire mix to break down after this so i am going a little fast mix up the song we have to break down yeah so anybody if anybody has a, any doubts just feel free to ask okay no doubt anybody everybody else anybody else has any doubt what is bridge okay so bridge is basically like a song a part of a song where the sound shifts to a different feeling yeah so like the chords of the song will be different like the repetitiveness of the song will end there yeah so if you see before you can see the seventh marker right which is written b1 so that signifies the bridge of the song so if you look at the sections before it you can see a very repetitive vibe like v1 c1 v2 c2 and then intro pre intro v1 c1 v2 c2 it is like a very repetitive vibe of the song yeah so when it actually hits this part the feelings of the song change the chords of the song change yeah so and the mood the temperament the timbre everything changes right so that is calling it as a bridge of the song it is like it is it is not necessary to call it a bridge you could call it a different section also it is just some nomenclature that we gave to you know communicate better you could call this section strings wala section or this andu pandu section you can name you can name it anything it is not like a bridge has this should be a bridge or anything like that so it is just a nomenclature that we ended up giving it and which is tech like used in common practice in a professional environment also so we ended up using that nomenclature so you can name it anything you could call the chorus as whatever you like like you could name it uh, whose doubt was that you could name it the rugved section you could call it uh, the sanika section it is not necessary to call it chorus or verse it is just no some nomenclature that is given for musicians to communicate better la so like everybody won't be knowing who sanika is or who rugved is correct so but every musician will know what a chorus is right so it is just some nomenclature that is given so rugved uh, was i clear is bridge what is a bridge clear to you yeah great so after that so it, it again goes like i can stress this point enough but uh, we wanted this section to again uh, hit a little bit harder so we mellowed down the section like the bridge so this section could hit a little more right? so the ninth sec so ninth section which is happening so ninth marker you can see here which is enable c3 is where the energy again goes like up like crazy right so if you listen to this you could hear it right like the energy goes up like 3 4 notches or 3 5 6 notches yeah so again the same thing the difference between two sections should be more so the preceding section will have more energy same philosophy so after that ud ja re this section happens yeah so there is this tuned down guitar which is playing here correct so this section is happening here so what uh went into doing this is like we wanted a breakdown before the scale of the song changes so anybody has a doubt what the scale of a song is
Sanika, you have a doubt what the scale of a song means? Anybody has a doubt what scale means? I guess not. No. Okay. So the song changes to a different. Okay. So Rukbed has a doubt. Okay. So a scale of a song is basically a set of notes that are defining a song, correct? So you have your basic Sari, Gama, Pada, Nisa, and your Hindu, Hindustani classical music, right? But all these different rags will have different set of notes. So some notes, some notes will be different in some rag depending on uh, what rag you're performing, right? So that is what makes up a scale. A scale is a basically a set of notes or chords. So like sa re ga ma pa dha ni sa. So that is basically a major scale. So I guess Tanay and Chitra might have talked about what a major or minor scale is when they were teaching about production yesterday. So major scales are basically happy scales. You like, you feel happy when you listen to major scales and minor scales are a little moody or uh, sad or like they have a pathos in them, I guess. Um, yeah. So that is what a scale is. It's just a set of notes. So this section happens and then this whole breakdown thing happens when all the instrument enters and there is a bass playing. The scale changes like ta -ri -ra -ri -ra, the scale changes in that section, right? So from a D, it goes on one scale above, which is E. But again, the same chorus, again, the same chorus, just in a different scale, which also gives like uh, uh, uplifts the song a little, okay? So then I think we should get. Anything, anybody has a doubt in the production of the song? Any doubt, anything, just feel free to ask. Uh, like why we did what we did. Anybody has a doubt, just feel free to ask. If nobody has a doubt, yeah, we'll move on to the mix of the song and, you know, proceed further because like we have only close to one hour remaining for our time because I was told from five to eight. So we'll cover. Could you talk a little on the creation of the pads? What pads? Creation of pads. Like, what do you mean the pads? Like in this song, do you need me to talk about a particular element or like pads in general, like synths and all? You can just unmute yeah. yourself and speak. You don't have to type. Yeah, okay. No, in general, to fill spaces. Okay. So I come from a very analog mentality of, you know, playing guitars. And I like to have less number of, um, you know, synth or program or computerized elements, let's say, in the song. But like there was a situation where we couldn't record the drums live. So we ended up programming and that is a different issue that are just some problems that we faced. So we couldn't record the drums live. So the drums are programmed, but uh, I think Sanika, I am out of my depths when speaking about synths or pads because I have not used those stuff as much and I don't want to give you any uh, half or false knowledge about anything. So excuse me for that. But uh, what 
in theory basically means is whatever you are adding yeah so you are adding synths any synth to a particular song you like yeah so even if pads or there is some synth element to it so whatever just keep one thing in mind when you are creating pads everything is relative right you might like it somebody else might not like it okay so whenever you are creating any synth elements for your song just keep in mind that they are adding to your song and not you know destroying or having any destructive effects on the song yeah so like if you could if we could look at i look at it that way the strings in this song i am looking you could look at them as synths correct so whatever synth parts are playing in the song they are always adding to the song and not um taking away or taking your attention away from what the main theme of the song is right so if you look at these synths in the intro or if we look at these synths from the bridge aandhi se bhed ja tu paano se lad man if you talk about the synths as a as a because these are very ambiently ambient program synths the uh, effect the library i'm using for this synth is called um the spitfire symphony orchestra which is like the free library they gave you and this is like i am uh like i'm using this because this uh uh the library is recorded or sampled at air studios in london which is like which is a big very big cathedral which they have converted into a uh, into a what we say a recording facility and it has like very very ambient and very live room so it has like close to 3 like correct me if i'm wrong if anybody knows about this but that studio has like a reverb reverberation time of close to 5 4 or 5 seconds so if there is anything playing like a very short element that is playing like even if a click like that is playing its reverb will continue for like 5 or 6 seconds or so so it is it gives off that very ambient vibe to the song and because it is recorded in a very ambient room like i said earlier you are acoustics matter a lot in the good rule i showed earlier your acoustics matter a lot so where you record and how you record the strings or whatever element that you are recording matters a lot to how it uh, what how or what it means in the context of the song so this uh, like it again lends to it being categorized as art yeah so these you can see these these strings are being used as pads here or synths here because they are not actually live played so just keep in mind whatever you are, there are like for music there are no limitations right whatever you do you can do whatever you can do anything imaginable you could um create any kind of pad you want or any synth you want you are limited only by your imagination yeah so just keep in mind uh um uh, you keep in mind that it is adding to your song and not shifting your attention from what the main goal of your song is correct sanika uh like i could only talk about since that much because even i am starting like i have only a few years of experience in all this field so i might not be the correct person to uh, you know 
answer your doubts in a very deep manner but i did what i could so parth bavaskar says you can get presets i'll suggest that yeah presets are good starting point and i'm i am actually learning about since and as we speak of it like but learning never stops right so i guess we'll see what happens after so i guess now we'll move on to the actual mix of the session so uh when tane and chitral were conducting the session yesterday did they talk about buses and tracks and whatever um you know happens what a digital audio workstation is what a track is did they talk about that anybody i'm sorry i was busy in a uh show yesterday uh, my band had a show yesterday so we were busy in that so i couldn't attend the yesterday section excuse me for my negligence or what not but was that part covered yesterday is anybody give me an update chitra uh, if did you cover buses and um tracks and fx sense and what their equalizers and compressors are sort of okay so i guess they'll have a basic idea then so what is happening and what a track is so you can dive in deep yeah but i i'll i'll try to clear as much stuff as possible but if time permits we'll clear everything if it doesn't i don't know let's see so when the actual i ended up mixing it so for the vocals uh there was mm, just hold on a second yeah so there is some this is a very free reaper stock plugin that i am using for tuning so when these vocals were recorded no, nobody sings that perfect right so i ended up um you know pitch correcting it uh before i ended up and started mixing it so after pitch correction there is a very little uh auto tune that is happening like very 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 minute like you won't be able to even tell if it is auto corrected so just just to keep it in check and because humans are known to make mistakes yes so it is just there to keep in check whatever is happening then for the vocals i am using something called as a dsr first in the signal chain so i explained signal chain earlier right so this is what i am using first for the signal chain so dsr basically what it does is it um it uh, it it turns down your ss in a singing right so all these noises are turned down because when you listen to a song and the singer is going it is very annoying to hear so a dsr turns those down so if you uh if you can see when he is singing when whenever he hits a s sound there is a section that is highlighted in orange so that is the dsr working and turning down a the ss of the noise uta parinda tha aasman mein so you see this orange section that is highlighted here so that is the s s sing ss that are happening so it is turning down the ss so that is first in the signal chain then we hit a very general eq this is the a uh, slate virtual mix rack uh anybody getting confused here just tell me yeah this is because this is very a little advanced stuff if anybody is confused as to what eq is or what a compressor is just uh unmute yourself and start speaking yeah, i'll uh i'll stop explaining and then explain clear your doubt and then we'll go further so should i go further or anybody has any doubt because this is a little advanced stuff considering like you just 
are newbies to all this stuff if you, if you have if you don't have any doubt at this point just say no <clears throat> or if you have doubt just tell me no okay no so we'll start so what an eq is that is basically like a masala right and eq is equalizer you will learn those of you all are electronics engineers or are pursuing electronics engineering you will learn it in your later semesters what an equalizer is or how you build an equalizer yourself but in uh basic sense what an equalizer is is a type of masala you put in cooking right so every one of these elements or plugins that i am talking about they are some sort of masala that i am adding to the um raw recorded files correct so when you are cooking you add different kinds of masalas to it right so all of what i am doing here is basically adding that masala and making that difference from and taking it up a notch so what an equalizer is it it basically adjusts what uh how much of a frequency you like the, it adjusts the relative balance of the frequencies in the song or in the recorded audio right so there are like in this equalizer this is based on an analog console like very old analog console so which is called an ssl console which is the ssl is called solid state solid state logic so it is a uk based company fantastic uh company like legends in the audio business so this ssl style equalizer i'm using it to you know just give the uh, vocals a little bit of sheen on top of it so uh if anybody doesn't understand the lingo just type yeah okay like if you understand don't understand what sheen is or what thump is or what crackle is just unmute yourself or type so it is just uh boosting a little bit like 1 db or so on the of 1 db or so of 7.2 1000 hertz so 7.2 kilohertz i'm boosting a little for the vocals these are all just these are all just creative decisions that were taken with the band and i like i was in constant touch with the band of whatever is needed to be done whatever is needed to happen and there is just a little sheen that is added on top of it for the voice the main lead vocal which is sung by chinmay ketkar and sung fantastically i cannot praise him enough so it is like uh just adding a shelf curve so if you don't know what a shelf curve is so if you have a eq right so a shelf curve will basically boost the frequencies like this so it will have a uh, rise and the frequencies will stay boosted after that section it is not like a bell curve where a certain amount of center frequency is boosted or cut which which will have a bell curve right so only that bandwidth of frequency is uh boosted of cut uh you know it is not like that it is just like this and it goes on boosting the frequencies like that to the whole audio spectrum so there is a little cut that is happening at around 5.5000 hertz which is a very um a uh, very sharp notch cut then i am boosting the mids a little just to give the voice a little warmth uh and then there there is nothing happening to the low end then i am again boosting the 15000 hertz frequency a little just to add even more sheen or shine or presence to so it's like the high frequencies of the song or the uh, voice it will give you like it will sound good when there are a little bit more highs present in the voice so that is happening then i am compressing the voice a little this is modeled after the very 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 famous uh uh la2a compressor which is an optical compressor like optical based optical trigger mechanism uh based compressor which is made by uh uad nowadays or it was i don't remember exact the original company that was making it 
but that is what is happening here. Then I am adding a little bit of that dirt I was talking about earlier in the analogy of the pani puri I gave you. So whatever these analog systems were, they were adding like all analog systems will have some kind of saturation to them, some kind of dirt that is being added, some kind of distortion that is being added, and some kind of you know different kind of masala that is being added to your flavor, but so that I'm I'm bringing in that analog flavor into the song, so that that is happening. With this, uh, after this, there is another compressor which is modeled after the famous, um, you know, uh, the 1176 compressor that is very very famous on vocals, and it has a very fast attack and very fast release. If anybody has a doubt about how compressors work and what are the parameters of a compressor, just type yes. I'll comp I'll tell about compressors in a little very short manner, so you don't get confused later because there is some extensive stuff stuff that is happening later on that might be difficult to understand. So and that is I'm starting with uh, vocals and all. So if anybody wants me to explain what a compressor is or what an attack of a compressor is or what the release of a compressor is. Yes, so a compressor is basically. You all know about data compression, right? What data compression does is it takes a big chunk of data and compresses it and into a small chunk of data, right? But you don't actually lose any data. So that it is the same thing when it comes to audio. But what it does is like when you are singing, you might sing some parts loud and some parts soft. So that might what might end up happening in the uh, when you are putting out the final song is like the whatever your element is, it will end up jumping out of the song or not being audible or it is very audible or it is not audible at all. So to reduce that, a compressor is used to tame the amplitude of the song, correct? So what a compressor will do is there there is this this is a waveform, right? If imagine my hand is a waveform, this this is a waveform, correct? So what a compressor will have is it will have like a threshold control. So when the threshold, when the noise or the sorry, not noise, um, when the signal goes above the threshold, it will reduce that. It will not it will not chop or clip or you know, clip the signal, it will just reduce it in level. Like if this signal goes, this is a threshold and the signal goes above it. So it will reduce that signal and by like there is a ratio control on a signal uh, uh, on a compressor. So for a ratio of two is to one, a uh, compressor will reduce. Uh, just a second. Yeah. A compressor will reduce the signal for every 2 dB a signal goes above the compre uh, the threshold. This compressor will reduce it by 1 dB. Yeah, so that is how a compressor will work. And that it will give you like a stable waveform and your audio uh, or your signal won't vary in amplitude as much. So for the vocals, it is a very central element of the song, right? So it it needs to be always uh, it needs to be always heard when you are um, when you are listening to it. So like most of the people listen to the vocals first or the lyrics first when you are uh, listening to a song. So that for that reason, the vocals are like compressed very much. So that is happening and. There is another round of multiband compression. So, it, my what a multiband compressor basically is, it it compresses a specific uh, set of frequencies instead of if you compare it with this compressor, it will just compress the whole frequency spectrum with the same amount. But what a multiband compressor like this Fab Filter Pro NB will do is like it will compress different bandwidths of frequencies by different amounts. So that also helps a little. This is also a very deep feel and we have like half an hour almost remaining, half an hour, 35 minutes remaining. So I'll just, I'm not going in deep as much 
in the explanation part but if you have any doubts just feel free to ask i'll attend to everything uh, so my, that is done for the vocals now what when mixing uh, i like to have a top to down approach so what it basically means is how many of you know about the elora caves in aurangabad elora caves ajanta elora caves but just the elora caves how have, has anybody been there or shanika says yes yash says yes so you all know about elora caves in aurangabad right so if you know a little bit about them they are a monolithic uh, structure that yeah. were created from uh, they were they were carved out of a one stone and they basically started from the top and they ended up carving the whole temple from first the top and then they went to the bottom so what this top to down approach means is what the my all these 90 audio tracks 90 or so audio tracks are boiling down to one master channel right so there is for for basic streaming services there are only two channels of audio one is left and one is right correct so what all these 92 tracks are doing is they are basically summing down to one master channel so when doing that this master channel becomes the top of the uh, or the the most important channel in your you know all the tracks so if your master is mute and there is nothing or a master is not working for some reason there is no audio that is going to be delivered or there is no audio that is going to be present so this is like the top of the song so when i like to compress like i like to first add my masalas to the um master channel itself so whatever i do later is in accordance to what whatever I, whatever i have added to my master channel so if you can see the first are three compressors that i have put which are doing very 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 little amount of compression so if you if i play you the song so if you see the songs are not the compressor is not even hitting like 3 db of compression in the most up front are the most told for part of the song so little like in every scenario like uh, small things amount to a larger greater good yeah so greater good so this is doing some amount of compression this 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 also by the way is modeled after an old ssl compressor which is called ssl g comp it is like very 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 famous vca vca based compressor and then there is this fairchild emulation which is also a different type of compressor and there is this focusrite model compressor at the end of the signal chain so that is doing very very little too because i am like turning down the ratio between the affected signal and the unaffected signal so there is only uh, only 36% of the affected or compressed signal that is present that is coming out of this uh, uh compressor so it is called parallel compression uh, if you, anybody wants me to explain more on parallel compression just say yes otherwise we will go ahead okay so again okay again uh after this there is another slate which is the company it's virtual mix rack so this is basically again adding that analog flavor to the whole song so it is basically again adding sheen so what basically you have to keep in mind is whatever things you do on the master channel will are going to affect every channel that is present in your session so if i if you have like 90 tracks if you add 1 decibel of uh, 12000 hertz it is going to add 1 decibel of 12000 hertz to every track that is present in your song so keep that in mind and then just there is some very very minor stuff that is happening in here again analog flavor again some shine 
some very very little uh, i guess this is not doing anything just adding you as you can see it is adding 0.42 decibels of 8k or so frequencies to in an analog flavor so again after this after this there is another uh, virtual tape machine so tape machine is when i said after lps there were magnetic tapes yeah so those tapes had some amount of analog compression that were that was imparted to the audio that was recorded and recorded onto the tape because the tapes did not have that faster response to you know uh, uh what do we say you know faster response to have a very fast signal or very transient signal so they used to compress the signal in a very pleasing way so this is adding that tape flavor or tape masala to the uh, song then there is another eq that is present which is not doing anything in the eq part but it is just uh, making all the frequencies below 60 hertz and taking all the frequencies below 60 hertz and making them into a mono signal so i guess everybody knows what a mono and stereo is so that is happening with the vocals and for the strings it is nothing much just a little bit of the same fairchild compression and a little bit of reverb uh then we then again there is a piano reverb that is happening very little eq just a little high pass filtering happening with the piano there are the effects that are happening with the song the piano is um EQ'd a little the in the bridge section which is the, when the piano enters this track it is EQ'd a little just notching out small small frequencies by the way i'm using a stock compressor provided by reaper itself so basically the daw i'm using right now is called reaper so it is the stock compressor or the default compressor that is uh, given with the daw by the way this daw is free and it is something called as a donation ware software so if you want you can purchase it or if you don't there is an unlimited uh, trial period that they offer so it is like a very good and cheap starting point if you want to begin your audio journey so when we look now we'll come down to the bass okay so when the bass is playing if i'll solo the bass to you you will hear that the bass has a little bit of grit on it so grit is like uh, distortion and edgy very the bass is very edgy yeah so in mixing uh what we'll do is i'll just i just need a 2 minutes break somebody is calling me i'll just need a 2 minutes break and i'll come back i'm so sorry greetings fellow humans i am back sorry for the break uh, so what uh, we are doing with the bass is we are adding a different flavor again so this is a very very primitive uh, this is an eq which is added by which this is a eq equalizer which is modeled after a very very primitive uh, equalizer which was made using vacuum tubes so if you have any idea what a vacuum tube is or if you don't research them they are a very important stage in electronics 
right so yeah so it is adding a little bit of 100 hertz and at the same time cutting down a little bit of the 100 hertz so what this is it is the uh, the boost which is happening is a shelf boost so like i told you all the frequencies below 100 hertz are being boosted here so and the cut is a bell cut so the cut is happening in a bell curve shape so uh so what this is called with this is a very famous trick used by many engineers worldwide which is called the pull tech style trick so the eq which it is modeled after the hardware eq which this plugin is modeled after is called the pull tech equalizer so that has this feature where you can cut and boost at the same time so i am doing that so and and i'll just play the bass a little yeah so i'll play it in solo and i'll remove this 100 hertz i'll bypass this eq and then i'll play this eq again so this is bypass there is no eq can you hear the difference there, there is some low end that is being added every when i'm engaging the uh, equalizer Could you all hear it? <clears throat> Could you all hear the change? Because I am not sure how good is it translating uh, on the stream. Okay, great. So that it is doing. Then again, I am using the slate. I am like the. I am a big fan of this slate plugins. Um, was anybody saying anything? Okay. So I'm a big fan of the Slate plugins, so I'm using it like everywhere. So and again, I'm adding that SSL analog flavor. I'm cutting. I'm adding again, adding a little sheen to the bass, shine to the bass, or I'm adding a little bit of uh, high frequencies to the bass, just so the bass is bass is audible. Because if you do not have high fre like you might think that it is a bass element, so there are no high frequencies needed. but it is exactly the opposite like you need high frequencies for the bass to be audible na because uh these frequencies will cut through when i say cut through like i mean like they will be audible when i am playing the whole the bass with the whole song so bass i am adding a little bit of high frequencies i'm notching down a little bit of 6 kilohertz i'm not i'm again notching down a little bit of 380 or 390 hertz just a little 3 db cut then i am high passing the bass at 20 hertz then i am again uh, attenuating the 200 hertz band by 2 db and then i am using a distressor which is like a do it all know it all compressor and it can do any type of compression you want it is the basic idea that was used when it was being developed was that it can it was able to do the kind of compression that three different um models of compressor would compressors would offer so when we i told you about the LA2A compressor right for the vocals it can do that thing here it can do the VCA style or uh, the FET style compression which is which is like a very fast response compressor and the LA2 is a very slow response compressor so it is uh it is modeled after a hardware unit which was designed to model other hardware units so it is a bit weird in that sense but it is compressing the bass as you can see it is a very little compression again very very little compression like 3 dB what compression very 3 db compression i mean like it is reducing the free, uh, signal which is going above the threshold by 3 db so it is called gain reduction so it is reducing the gain of the signal right whatever the signal is going above the threshold it is reducing the gain of the signal by 3 db so as you can see it is like on a 2 is to 1 ratio uh, a relatively slower attack a fast release and the input and output knobs are set accordingly to how much compression i want so again an interesting fact about this is this is a fixed threshold compressor which means that you cannot change the threshold itself 
but there is an input gain knob which is given uh, in the compressor itself which can boost the signal that is hitting the threshold so instead of reducing the threshold we are increasing the signal to go above the threshold so it works in that way so then the trimmer is not doing anything i have just kept there for phase if there were any phase issues present in the mix uh, then there is a fantastic plugin made by a fab filter which is called the saturn 2 which is adding a little bit of saturation and there is a sub synth which is artificially generating low frequencies in the bass so i'll play with with and without so this is with and this is without you could hear that that low frequencies that were audible right there was such so much more girth that was present to the whole bass any more doubts any doubts just say yes or no for tafat we are running out of time yeah. uh, like there are many more elements yeah. to cover okay no so then we'll move on to the guitars so i have i'm i'll just skip through and like bas explain basically what is happening where and we will concentrate more on the drums because i was asked by my fellow audio engineers and many others that your drums are sounding great in the song what did you actually do to make those sounds sound great so i'll explain the guitars and we'll concentrate more on the drums okay so and also if anybody wants to try and wants to listen to this song on their own and wants to solo each element like drums you want to listen akele matlab like solo drums you want to listen to or solo guitars you want to listen to uh i am willing to give out the multi tracks of the song so if anybody wants that and wants to try mixing it uh i am willing to you know just text chitril or text anybody who is representing csi or text a uh, floating bottle on instagram what not and we'll get in touch with you and we'll supply you with the multi tracks and you can you know try mixing the song on your own like i won't give you all the 90 tracks i'll bounce it down to three or four stereo files of the basic elements that are playing so if you want a hands on experience and you want to do the hands on stuff i'm willing to give you the multi tracks the songs too so just contact any representative of csi or contact me or contact or uh, just dm in dm on the instagram page of the floating bottle music and we'll get in touch with you and supply the multi tracks okay so we'll go ahead with the guitars now uh so for the intro guitar lead what was this which was playing for the intro correct so this lead so it is again basically again the slate virtual mix rack it is compressing a little Uh, it is attenuating uh attenuating a little bit of the 460 hertz so that is happening and this acme compressor it is actually not compressing much it is just adding that analog flavor to the guitar which it adds a light, nice warmth and grounds the uh element down a little then there is a rhythm guitar that is playing where i'm using an emulation of again the ssl but this time i'm using the plugin alliance uh version this is again a fantastic plugin uh made by brainworks it like again a little 1 db of sheen sheen or high frequencies 0.8 decibels of 4.3 kilohertz cutting down a little bit on like 1.8 decibels of 700 hertz by the way all these decisions are creative decisions yeah so nothing is like a fixed formula that you can apply like oh uh, he like speaking in my relation like if you attend this workshop and you go ahead with the multi tracks and you try mixing it yourself and you say that i cut like 1 decibel like like if you learn today that 
he cut one decibels on the guitar so that is why i'll cut one decibel on my guitar and that will sound great but it doesn't work that way it's all relative so again uh, a thing that we learned early on in my audio production or sound or sound engineering journey is we learned two terms one is called depends raju depends so what it basically means is depends raju depends means raju is a imaginary person who is asking us why you are doing what you are doing and he did that in that song so you do that in this song so our sound song will sound great so we tell him that depends raju depends that song is different this song is different and not everything that was done in this song will make this song sound good so that is what you will learn with experience as what you can do to make something sound great so and the second term is called rtfm it is it is it stands for read the freaking manual so when like you know why i'm using freaking there's a different word instead of freaking there but we were taught very early on that when you are using a new equipment uh don't go and just try out stuff and start pressing buttons and uh like figuring out on the go don't do that like there are very very expensive equipments that will be present and if you are learning with somebody else and you are doing a job somewhere else and you blow up uh like you damage a uh, 3 4 lakhs worth of equipment who is supposed to pay that so instead of just going on trial and error read the freaking manual so that is uh, also a different rule that i learned very early on so now for the guitars there is not much that is happening there is just some analog flavor that is being added here and there some shine some cut some boost some compression and so that that uh, anybody has any doubts at this moment because i am going to the drums and that is a little bit deeper because drums define the energy of your song so before we go to that i want if anybody has any doubts concerning what is happening or didn't understand anything just feel free to ask and i'll try and cover the doubt anybody okay so i'm guessing nothing so when going to the drums the drums are programmed right so like tanay and chitral explained yesterday there is a set of midi notes that are happening so instead of um, you know having a real drummer play we had some difficulties actually recording the drums live so we ended up programming the drums so these are all virtual drums and all, if you can see all of these are in different colors so whatever beat it is playing there are a different velocity the different velocities it is being programmed at so if it is a very colorful file it looks nice also so and it when you have such elements where you are programming the drums it is very difficult to get that human feel into the drums but luckily we were able to do that quite well and uh, we were praised like so each of this will have a sample that is being played so if i just and go on clicking so as you can see there is only one sample that is present at each of the midi channel so it is the prog- drums are programmed that way so the drums basically have uh like there is a kick ha- acha tell me how many of you all have seen an actual drum kit like a proper rock drum kit just give a thumbs up yes no yes sanika has seen darshan hasn't seen okay so darshan uh, you you haven't seen a drum kit yeah so wait
So I'll just share a different screen. Just hold on here. Yeah. yeah, can you all see this? So this is what a drum kit looks like. So this is if uh, I'm going to explain. So this, uh, can you all see my mouse pointer? Yes. Yeah. So this is what a drum kit looks like. So this big drum and on the floor is called the kick. This drum which I'm pointing at, which is present behind the kick is called the snare. These are called toms. So first tom, first rack tom, because these are mounted on a rack, right? So first rack tom, second rack tom, and this is a floor tom. So that is what a bit, and these are called symbols. All those thali like elements that you see here, these are called symbols. So uh, when uh, I just just hold, oh yeah. Uh, so all the there are, the kick is coming to a different track. My snare. So there are two mics on the snare drum. When this the software works, is they gives you two mics uh, for the snare drum. So um, the snare top mic and the snare bottom mic come on a different channel. The toms come out on four different channels. The cymbals come out on a different channel and the room mics come out on a different channel. So that is how I'm processing the drums. So for first on the drums, on the drum bus. So what a bus basically is, it is a summing point. It is like all the drums tracks, all the drum tracks are boiling down to one point, one track, one stereo track. So I am uh, adding a little bit of tube saturation to the drums, uh, which is again a fantastic plugin made by Plugin Alliance and Brainworks. It is called the Black Box Analog Design. It adds like pentode and triode saturation. These are all vacuum tube saturations uh, that is being added here. Then for the kick, there is an EQ that is a very aggressive EQ that is happening here. So I'm cutting down. This is by the way called as a graphic equalizer. So you can see what the actual graph of the uh, thing you are doing here. So uh, it is cutting like high passing to like 30 Hertz. It is cutting a little bit of one, uh, like a lot of 1.7 kilohertz. Uh, fair amount of 570 hertz then a little bit of 150 hertz uh, and then a little bit of 52 hertz this 10 kilohertz cut i'm doing is because there was i was finding there was some very clicky element like if you uh, have heard a click right so that kind of element was present a little bit more so i ended up cutting the 10.6k section and after the EQ, there is again uh, SSL style compression that is happening and EQ that is happening. So if I'll play the drums for you in solo, uh, you can see the amount of gain reduction here. Okay, so. So as you can see, it is barely compressing the kick very little. Also, like we talked about the ADSR of the signal, right? So what it is, what it basically gives is, it gives us the transient response of the signal. So if a signal has, like I wanted to change the transient response of the signal a little. So the kick, I am adding a bit of attack to the kick like when when i was hearing the song in my headphones and all on my your speakers wagera i was finding that the kick doesn't have that impact to it so first initial attack it doesn't have that so i ended up transient it is what is called as transient shaping so i am actually changing the shape of the transient response of the kick so i am adding a little bit of attack no sustain nothing just a little bit of attack uh, so that basically gives 
us the kick channel so when i'm what i'm doing with the kick channel is i am sending a copy of this process signal uh i am reducing it by 6.3 db i am sending a copy of this signal to a different track okay so what this track is doing is it is doing a fair amount of parallel compression as you can see it is a very high ratio so very a uh, high amount of compression is happening here so if you can see if you can see the gain reduction here like see on the snare head it is going to like 14 or 12 db of compression here so it is adding it is adding a different amount of flavor of compression to this thing and i'm adding a limiter here just because i didn't want the signal to clip um uh, then we'll move on to the snare so i showed you the snare snare it is also boiling uh, both the mics of the snare are coming down to one uh, snare bus again similar to the drum bus and i'm very little eq very little analog flavor again some shine some gold gold and then again a little bit of transient shaping i wanted that more attack on the snare so i ended up transient shaping this to uh little bit of 8000 hertz little bit of 3000 hertz a, a decent cut at 500 hertz and a boost at around 200 hertz so that is happening to the snare channel also what matters a lot with drums is the amount of ambience the drums have so when we speak of ambience if i mute the ambience tracks on the drums you will find that the drums lose their quality and just are weird sounding elements so i'll pl i'll play it with a with the ambience and without the ambience so this is with the ambience this is without this is without the ambience as you can see there is a vast difference and the quality of sound that is being produced is like very different with the ambience and without the ambience so for the ambience i am using the verb suite classics by slate again big fan of slate uh, it it is uh, modeled after a music club it is like it has a decay of around 1.3 1.03 seconds and no not adding any stereo weight to it not eqing anything just a little bit of cut uh, here and there just to reduce the annoying noises and a uh, high pass to reduce the rumble in the snare so for the toms uh uh there is again a saturn 2 which is adding a saturation there is again a tom bus and all the four toms are summing down to a tom bus there is again a little bit of analog flavor which is not doing anything as such just adding that analog flavor then there are some eqs that are happening with the drums a eh, sorry uh, with the toms like all the strong i am reducing all the papery elements of present in the eq frequencies like this when you strike a paper right when you strike a paper you hear all this paper frequencies right so i am reducing all those type of frequencies in here then just tastefully eqing like i find that eqs are the easiest thing to learn like everybody can eq stuff it is like making scrambled eggs everybody can make scrambled eggs but only a few can uh, make good scrambled eggs right everybody can crack eggs in a pan do this and make scrambled eggs but not everybody can make good scrambled eggs i'm not saying that i make good scrambled eggs or i eq great but it's just an analogy that i wanted to give which might uh, you know justify as to why eqs are difficult to learn so for the symbols there is again a little bit of high passing with the graphic eq again reducing around the paper frequencies notching a little frequencies to reduce the annoying symbol noises that are happening uh, then there is again an analog uh, such flavor that i am adding i am compressing the uh, overheads or it symbols a little so
this this is just the symbol track the only symbols that are recorded as you can see i'm compressing on the snare it's very heavy it just to reduce the snare in the what do you say in the overheads does anybody have any doubt just say no yes guys no okay so um when we'll move on to the rooms so rooms are basically capturing the room that this track is recorded in so when we play the rooms you'll know that are this sounds like hearing drums in a actual room so i'll play it now sounds like uh, you are hearing it in a room so they are actually recording the room that these drums were recorded in or sampled in so again i am compressing the shit out of this uh, the room tracks you can see like six or seven decibels of compression uh, happening here so that is obliterating and increasing the sustain of the drums so when doing this this covers up our mix so anybody has any doubts anybody has anything you know want to ask anything any lame doubt anybody has just feel free to ask don't shy i'm not going to kill you no doubts as such mm okay so now we'll move on to the ambience that we are using for the vocals uh by the way any csr representative can tell me how much time we have left so i'll conduct it accordingly no no it's really up to you we can extend the session if you want okay no there is not much left because there are just ambient tracks and mastering levels that i need to talk about so i maybe take 15 20 minutes more yeah works works yeah so for creating the ambience i'll just play the vocal solo to y'all and if you can hear it well and good like i'll be muting the ambience tracks from the vocals and you will hear what difference it makes okay udta parinda tha aasman mein aasman mein धरती पे अनजान रे सो दिस इज विद द एंबियंस दैट इज एडेड ओके सो देयर देयर टू रिवर्ब्स दैट आई एम एडिंग वन डिले एंड वन स्लैप बैक दैट आई एम एडिंग हियर सो आई विल जस्ट म्यूट इट एंड देन ऐड इन बिटवीन सो इट विल शो यू हाउ व्हाट इंपैक्ट इट इज क्रिएटिंग उड़ता परिंदा था आसमान में आसमान में धरती पे अनजान रे छिन गई थी उसकी आजादिया झुटता था दम उसका बेजान रे यू ऑल गुड हियर इट राइट द वर्ड काइंड ऑफ डिफरेंस अ गुड एम्बियंस मेक्स टू योर वोकल्स और वट एवर ट्रैक्स यूर यूजिंग इट सो for the ambience that i'm creating for the vocals i am by the way feel free to tell me if i'm going fast or do i need to slow down or do i need to explain a section a little bit more just feel free okay so for this uh for the long one i'm using a long reverb and a short reverb for this and for the longer one i'm having a decay of around 2.03 milliseconds which is modeled after the anm studios uh and it is like it is named the chamber 1 and it has a dk of uh 2.3 milliseconds a pre delay there is not much going on here for the short reverb 
I am adding a reverb of close to 700 milliseconds. So it is like a very short, roomy reverb, which is aptly named empty room. So when you go into a new house, yeah, so you don't have any furniture in there, and you speak in that room, so you hear, you hear yourself differently. That there is a different acoustic vibe to the room. There are not many reflective materials that are present. So for that, that kind of vibe, this uh, reverb is creating. Then there is a delay. So I'll solo the delay for you. So that is what it, what basically a delay sounds like. It is like it is like creating a copy of the signal and delaying it by so and so amount. So it plays after uh, the actual vocals are sounded. So I'll play the vocals with and without the delay now. So you'll get a better idea as to what delay is doing. So this is with the delay. So that kind of effect the delay is creating. So we'll move ahead to the orchestral ambience now. So to do that, we'll go to this orchestral reverb that I'm using again. Warp Speed Classic, same reverb, just a different model of a reverb called large stage, which is based after a scoring stage. The scoring stage is basically where you record an orchestra. So, so that is emul emulating that. Then for the piano, for the intro piano section, there is the same reverb, just different model of like three almost three seconds of decay and a chamber like a chamber which is like a very reverberant room for the bridge the same reverb is used for the piano um, for bass there is no reverb for guitars there is no reverb all the reverbs for the guitars are printed the drums reverb i have shown you okay so when you talk about putting a song on a streaming service yeah it needs to be on a particular level of loudness so uh, what a measure of loudness a different measure of loudness is is called as the lufs which stands for loudness units full scale so it basically measures the loudness as the human perceives it like a decibel scale is not how loud the human perceives it like uh, if you hear a sound at 80 decibels we might say we are hearing it at 60 decibels or 100 decibels. So LUFS scale measures in accordance to how the human hears. So basically, all the streaming sites will have a loudness rating of around minus 40 in LUFS. So you need to make sure that when you are putting out your song, when you are putting out your basic mix, uh, fine, sorry, not basic mix, the final mix or the final master version of your song on any streaming service, you need to make sure that it is up to that uh, level and not much beyond it. There is like a debate that is happening that what should you do? You Should you let the... Because if it is above that minus 14 LUFS mark, the streaming services will impose a penalty and will turn down your track just to have a similar loudness of... Uh, music in all of the songs that are present in the streaming service. So they'll impose a penalty and there is a big ongoing debate that whether you should uh, master to a particular LFS rating or you just master to whatever sounds good. So it is it is something called as a loudness wars that were happening. It is not like actual war, but some people were mastering louder, some people were mastering it a, quite, a little bit quieter. So that is what you need to keep in mind. And there are a lot many plugins that are available that tell you uh, what sort of loudness rating your sound is at. So one very good free plugin that you all can use is called this Yulin Loudness Meter 2. So whenever you play this, it will give you the integrated short term loudness range and the dynamics or it will give you every possible uh, LUFS rating related term and it will give you the, you, you, you are mattered more about this integrated rating of your loudness meter. 
So this integrated rating should reach close to minus 14 or whatever feels right for the song. So with that, I guess we are done with today's workshop. If anybody has any doubts, just feel free to ask. Anybody wants those multi-tracks, feel free to reach out to any CSI representative. Feel free to text me, DM me. So with that, we will conclude today's workshop. Thank you, everyone. Have a great year ahead, let's say. Wear masks. We don't need another like lockdown, okay? <laughs> Wear masks. Uh, can you suggest some YouTube channels for sound production? There uh, are a lot of different and varied channels. One good channel that I have been following for a long time is a channel run, uh, run by Warren Hewitt. He is running a channel called Produce Like a Pro. So when he breaks, like he goes on to like minor details and he explains everything very clearly and it has helped me a lot. Another channel is Andrew Huang. He is also, if you are into electro and synths and stuff, great channel to look onto. If you are more into rock, you could follow Eric Valentine's channel. Eric Valentine is a big time producer. He produces stuff for Slash and what, who not. Every big guy has worked with Eric Valentine. Uh, there is a YouTube channel by Rabia Massad. He is a progressive metal guitarist, if you are into that stuff. Then, uh, yeah, Chitral just posted a link of Warren Hewitt's channel. So, yeah, I guess the more you'll research, the more you'll find out channels that, that are suited more to your preferences. I follow these channels blindly, like, I follow every update, everything. You can also do that. So any more doubts? And a door to start with. So I started with Reaper and I'm still using it because it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it is very cheap. The It is very, 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 very low latency. Like it won't it is not as taxing on your CPU as much as other softwares. Uh, Reaper, it is called, I'll just type it out. Uh, it's called Reaper. It is like, I told you, it is like it has a free unlimited trial period or if you like it too much, you can end up buying it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not that expensive. Also, it is like six, 7,000 if you want to invest in the door, but it gives you like an unlimited trial period. So I've been using it and the trial period ever since. Pro Tools is great, but Pro Tools is a little expensive considering we all are students. Uh, yesterday, Tane and Chisel talked about re, uh, Ableton. Ableton is great. Basically, no door is better than the other. It, they are basically doing the same thing. It is like cooking food in different types of pans, right? You cook in a cast iron skillet, you cook in a steel, stainless steel pan, you cook in a Teflon coated pan. End of the day, your dish will be the same, correct? There will be just minor differences, very, 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 very minor differences that will be caused by the pan. It's the same thing. No one DAW is greater than the other. But I started with Reaper, so I'm speaking about Reaper. Chitral might have started with FL Studio or Ableton, so he might say FL Studio or Ableton is great. So it is It is also a never-ending cold war and debate like, oh, my A-Logic is better than everything or Ableton is better than everything or Reaper is better than everything or Pro Tools is better than everything. It is advice that you learn with something easy. So every DAW is majorly tailored to a bedroom producer nowadays. Like every DAW will have almost the same features and just minor differences. So it does actually doesn't matter what DAW you start with. But Reaper is great. I started with Reaper and I turned out great. So I don't know. Reaper is great. <laughs> Any more doubts? So should we conclude? Chitral, you have anything to say or should we conclude? 
no no you can conclude the session yeah so thank you all for joining it was fun interacting with you all finally yeah. got to do a workshop about something i'm crazy at crazy for and got to geek out thank you all and see you around bye bye